talk about failure criteria. So, we, yeah, we've been doing a whole bunch of stress calculations in this course, uh, figuring out how to figure out what our shear stress is or our various uh, normal stresses, how to take that and convert them to our prime, uh, st our, our prime stresses via our, our uh, more circle calculations, so on and so forth. Why do we do that? We don't really care what the stress level is. What we care about is whether or not this component is going to fail. So what we want to do is we want to, so we're going to be examining uh, how, what sort of um, uh, theories there are uh, that we can use to evaluate whether or not those stress levels uh, are going to cause failure. Uh, so it's, we'll start off with some ductile failure theories. Uh, so here's an example of a typical kind of uh, ductile failure. Uh, you tend to get uh, tend to get failure surfaces that are at 45 degree angles uh, from the uh, uh, axis of uh, of tension. So you get this is just a uniaxial uh, tensile test specimen. So you tend to get these like little cup and cone type of scenarios. Uh, if we so if we were to convert you know, look at that in our more circle. It'd be something like this. So um, when we take when we take uh, the it, when we have multi-axial uh, stresses that are occurring, uh, this is kind of yeah. You know, this is a somewhat typical pattern that we might that we might see, where we have uh, our sigma one and our sigma two, uh, sigma one on the one axis, sigma two on the other axis. So and again, the known the known scenario is that uh, the yield stress <laughs> is that that's our uniaxial stress there. So yield stress there. Obviously, if we just took it and pulled it in a different direction, it's it's a, a uh, um, it, it's yeah it's a material that doesn't act in uh, uh, it's an isometric uh, uh, material. So it's the material properties are the same in all directions. So in the same, in different direction would result in the same thing but you know adding uh, uh, adding two different stresses at the same time will affect it differently and it'll, and it'll affect it differently depending on whether or not uh, you know where uh, both those stresses are positive both the stresses are negative or if one's positive and one's negative <clears throat> So one theory, and this is probably the simplest one uh, that you'll see for uh, <coughs> for ductile, is the Tresca yield criterion, also known as the maximum shear stress criterion. So basically, uh, we just take uh, we just take the um, uh, you know we, we just take our sigma one. And I got our sigma two, and we just rotate our frame of reference until we get to our <clears throat> until we get to our maximum uh, shear stress condition, uh, and then whatever uh, whatever maximum shear stress uh, that we get uh, <clears throat> in the axial is so in the um, uh, in, in the uniaxial tensile test, that'll be the shear stress that would cause failure in multiaxial stresses. So basically, uh, we end up getting. So you'll you'll keep in mind that uh, I'll just draw a quick more circle here. So we we basically got two different scenarios here. Uh, so we got the scenario where we have both of them having the same signs. We have our sigma one and our sigma two here. Then keep in mind we've got a more circle here, and we've got a more circle here, and we get a more circle here. And the maximum shear stress is going to be based upon this. So whichever one of these is the largest in magnitude, that's going to be the one that determines our uh, maximum shear stress. And then the other scenario that we have is if we have opposite signs. So if we have opposite signs, so if we say we have sigma one here and sigma two here, and then we'll have this another one in the middle here. So again, maximum shear stress based upon our 
This, this, so this will this will be our maximum shear stress in the uh, in say the YZ. This will be our maximum shear stress in the uh, XZ. And then this here, this circle here, that amount will be the maximum shear stress in the XY. So that'll be the maximum. So basically, if the if you if you have opposite signs, uh, then increasing uh, if you have, yeah if you have opposite signs, then uh, you need to take both into account because uh, both of those will combine together in order to increase your um, uh, your, your maximum shear stress that you'll see, whereas if they both have the same signs, then it's just whichever is the largest that uh, dominates. <clears throat> the next one that we're going to look at, von Mises yield criterion. Uh, so, uh, also known as the Maxwell Huber Hanke von Mises theory. Uh, a lot of people contributed towards this theory at various points and didn't didn't necessarily collaborate with one another, didn't necessarily know other people were working on this as well. But anyways, whatever. Uh, almost everyone will refer to, most people just refer to it as the von Mises yield criterion. Uh, anyone who is going to be using a combination of names almost always includes von Mises. Uh, like uh, I think Maxwell von Mises is probably the most popular or Huber von Mises. Anyways, um, the uh, if you say von Mises, people know what you're talking about. Uh, and you know, don't worry about hurting their feelings because they've all been dead for quite some time. <laughs> uh, the other uh, description of this would be the maximum distortion energy criterion. So when I say distortion energy, uh, that's uh, changing the shape of the element. Uh, uh, shape, not size, because they noticed basically that pressure alone doesn't cause failure. So if we just push on this thing, you know, to if we throw it down in the bottom of the ocean, push on it, it's still not going to yield. It's going to shrink in size because we're putting pressure on it, but it's not going to yield as a result. So basically, uh, oh, the idea here is that you can break the uh, stresses that you're applying to this object up into average stresses and then other stuff and the average stress doesn't affect things whereas the other stuff the distortion energy that does so if it's the distortion energy uh, that does it then basically they just uh, kind of uh, uh, the distortion that does it uh, they they, they did it on the basis of the energy. So basically, how much energy is going into doing this and this and I guess this or you know whatever that happened to be. Um, uh, and then uh, they basically took the energy that went into the distortion and compared it to the energy that goes into the distortion at yield. Uh, so, so essentially, uh, when, we, when we get to it, uh, this tells us what our distortion energy is based upon the, uh, sorry, this gives us a von, a von Mises equivalent stress uh, that takes into account uh, all three prime axes, or all, all three prime, prime, prime stresses. Uh, obviously, in K, uh, and that's that's assuming that we kind of uh, this particular formula is assuming that we went and did the stress transformation to get it to the prime uh, uh, to to our primary stresses. Uh, so when this von Mises equivalent is equal to the yield stress, we should expect yielding. Uh, the so that's that's kind of the full one. Uh, if we had already done that transformation. If you hadn't done that transformation, but you're in a plain stress state, uh, then essentially you know your uh, or your 1, 1, your 2, 2, and the combination of those two, and you know your shear as well. So again, just uh, keep in mind that you know, we, might, we might call that tau 1, 2, if you, you're probably a bit more familiar with that uh, instead of the uh, sigma 1, 2, but same idea. So that ends up being uh, that ends up giving us a 
kind of it, in a plain stress state, this ends up giving us kind of a, a, a shape like this. Uh, so again, uh, I'll just draw, I'll just draw on here what the Trusca theory had. So, yeah. Oops. There we go. So you notice that the envelope for the von Mises yield criteria it's a, it's a bit bigger than what we saw for Tresca. So Tresca is going to be inherently more conservative of an assumption than von Mises. Uh, so uh, you, um, and, but generally, yeah, it, it's more in, uh, conservative of an assumption. Uh, I'd, I'd say von Mises is probably the most popular, uh, especially because. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, at least partially, because you take your, you know, you can take the stresses and pump out a von Mises equivalent, and that's, and that can be compared directly to the shear stress, whereas like if you'll notice, sorry, directly to the to the yield stress, whereas you notice for Tresca, you know, you don't get like a single value that tells you what the, you know, what the stress level is compared to your failure criteria. Uh, so uh, oftentimes, you know, like you'll, you'll get, fine, if you're doing finite element analysis, you'll get, it, you know, it'll, it'll just tell you what your von Mises equivalent is, and then you can run with that and uh, kind, of, kind of compare it directly. Uh, so I think, <laughs> I think that alone is probably responsible for a fair amount of the popularity of the von Mises yield criterion. As well, I mean, it lets you push a bit more of performance out of your modeling, right? Uh, you know, if you, you can operate here, or here, or here, or here, and still be considered safe. Uh, or well, you know, uh, however, uh, not, not necessarily safe, because if you're operating at that point, then your uh, safety factor is pretty damn near close to one, which is probably what you don't want it to be. Uh, but anyways, that's... Uh, that's next course. <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, that's the von Mises yield criteria. So the Tresca and von Mises are going to be the two most popular of the uh, of your uh, yield yield cri yield criteria for ductile materials. When we're looking at brittle materials, they're not quite as useful. Uh, they tend to operate differently. So uh, brittle materials, uh, we tend to have a fracture surface that is completely perpendicular to the uh, to the um, direction of the tension. Uh, or say, for example, if we do a torsion test, when we twist it, we tend to get these like 45 degree angles on the fracture surface relative to the uh, relative to those axes. We also tend not to be not to have it uh, kind of be mirrored about this axis. Uh, so uh, oftentimes uh, you'll get, uh, br br oftentimes brittle materials are going to be stronger in compression than they are in tension. So most of your, uh, most of your brittle material suitable uh, failure criteria will take that into account. This one doesn't, however, the Rankine, uh, the Rankine failure criteria, aka the maximum principal stress uh, criteria. This is the simplest possible freaking yield criteria. <laughs> Figure out what your max, what your highest maximum principal stress is, and if the absolute, uh, you know, the magnitude of the highest principal stress, and if it's more than the ultimate stress, then you're 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 at failure. Pretty bloody simple there. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, and again, it, it's suitable for some, those materials where you, we do we do where we don't really have that uh, that uh, uh, stronger that uh, stronger behavior in um, uh, in compression. We've got Morse failure criteria. Uh, so the Morse failure criteria does take that into account, uh, and it does it by so so yeah. There, there's a maximum stress, uh, uh, like a, just a sheer a maximum stress that 
takes into account the tension tensional compression. So uh, uh, that one's a box. It's just a box that's kind of uh, offset <laughs> uh, from the from the origin. Uh, but uh, uh, we oftentimes you'll see failures going on in this space here. So typically speaking, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's generally more popular to use uh, Morse criteria, where basically we're just, you know, we're drawing a line from here to here, and we're saying that anything kind of encompassed in this area here is safe. So uh, again, if both of these are tensile, then it's just whether or not either of your stresses, your sigma one or your sigma two, are bigger than your tensile stress. So as long as you're below that, as long as both of those are below your tensile stress, then you expect to be safe. Uh, if you both are compressive, then what? Then as long as the uh, as long as both your sigma one and your sigma one and your sigma two are less, uh, sorry, are greater than because again both those values are negative. Greater than negative uh, 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 sigma c, uh, your compressive strength, uh, stress, uh, sorry, your compressive strength, then you should be good to go. And then once you, once we get uh, uh, once we get any of those values that are less than that then we expect failure. And then uh, just, you know, the formula that kind of gives us these lines here. Uh, so if, if one is tensile and two is compressive, then uh, as long as this formula is true, then we'll be in this space. And then as, if one is compressive and two is tensile, then as long as this formula is true, then we'll be in this space. And then we're good to go. And uh, the next one we have is uh, so essentially um, it's similar idea. It's they're trying to take into account the fact that uh, you know uh, as you move uh, as you as you as you change the average stress. Uh, so you know uh, then you're going to get a shift of your uh, failure criteria. So essentially uh, what, what they do is, this is using uh, uh, more circles. So you're gonna have one circle that's plotted uh, for the compressive. So again, that'll be uh, you know, along the, the sigma axis, along the, along the normal stress axis, it's gonna be negative. So you're gonna get one point there, and it's gonna be larger than the other ones. And then you're gonna get a tensile one. And then, uh, so that'll be a positive on the sigma axis, and it's going to be smaller. <laughs> and then also in the middle here, there's going to be you, you could you could uh, based upon based upon the uh, so often the you know, they'll just do a torsion test uh, so, so figure out where, where the sh where a pure shear load fails, uh, and uh, that and that'll give you these three circles, and basically. Uh, we just draw a line that kind of fills in the gaps there. So essentially, as long as we have, so that, that's our failure envelope. So basically, uh, then uh, to compare what's going on there to, to what the situation we're, uh, so to compare the failure envelope to the situation that we actually have, we just need to, we just need to draw a more circle for for whatever uh, situation we have. So you know, if we have say, um, you know, if we have a sigma one here and a sigma one, two here, then again that would give us a uh, our average stress there, and we'd end up with something like that for our Mars circle. So it'd be within the failure envelope. Whereas if we had, say, uh, like a sigma, sigma two here, and a sigma one here, our average would be there, 
and it would be something like this. So that'd be outside our, our envelope. So essentially, uh, what we can do is we can figure out uh, what the failed criteria is based upon the radius of that uh, Moore's on the, uh, <coughs> Moore circle uh, that we're plotting. So uh, the, we know we know the radius uh, of the Moore circle based upon the uh, uniaxial compression, uh, and we know the radius of the. Uh, <coughs> And we, and we know the, the radius uh, based upon the uniaxial uh, tension. And that basically kind of as we move from here to here, uh, the, the, the acceptable radius size just drops linearly. So uh, that's how we how that's how we do that on the more circles. Uh, and essentially, it looks something like this. Uh, sorry, uh, it looks something like this for the uh, sigma one and sigma two graph. I will say, yeah, Morse Coulomb. I should say Morse Coulomb. Your your the textbook. Your I don't know for some reason that they, they kind of skipped the actual Morse one and they they went straight to Morse Coulomb and then forgot to credit Coulomb. But anyways, um, so yes, uh, that would be how you go about that. So those are basically the four failure criteria that I expect. Well, I guess five failure criteria because we yeah Rankin, Morse, Morse Coulomb for ductile, <coughs> Tresca, von Mises uh, for uh, uh, what you call it, <coughs> Tresca, von Mises for. Uh, your duct top. Uh, so as for selecting which one you're going to use, oftentimes that choice will be made for you. Uh, so you know if you you there may be some sort of um, <clears throat> there may be some sort of code or you know uh, maybe something in a contract that you're designing that specifies how how your design is going to be evaluated. Uh, so, That'll be selected for you. Uh, at the very least, if you're in charge of selecting failure criteria, you better be damn sure that you're not using something that's suitable for ductile failure for a brittle material and vice versa. Uh, and again, these aren't the only ones. Like the, there's some stuff that people have come up with that are better suited for concrete. Uh, some stuff that people have come up for come up with that might be better suited for uh, like materials that have been cold worked a significant amount uh, so that their grains are uh, distorted and they aren't quite isotropic anymore. Uh, so it kind of takes that directionality into account, which can be a giant pain, of course, but it is what it is. Uh, so, but the, the thing to keep in mind is uh, these are all models. These are our models. These are these are what we use to try to figure out how we are describing what happens in reality with math. All models are incorrect. All models are incorrect. Some models are useful. So you're, you're never you're never going to get any any model that 100% accurately. Uh, allows you to figure out exactly what's going to happen in all situations. That just doesn't happen. Uh, we, we can have models that will tell us to a good enough degree of precision or accuracy what's going to happen. It allows us to give good estimates of what's going to happen. And again, that's the, in, the inherent inaccuracy in our models is one of the reasons that we always go and slap a safety factor on things. Uh, one of the many reasons <laughs> that you know the, the, uh, the you know the, the models somewhat incorrect, uh, the materials aren't you know they don't always react exactly the same. You don't do a tensile you, you don't do a hundred tensile tests and get the same yield strength the entire each time. You're gonna get you know you're gonna get a certain range. You, you're gonna get like an average. Uh, and you're going to get some that, are, that some that yielded earlier and some that yielded uh, at higher struggles, just so, so on and so forth. 
but uh, yeah, just always keep in mind that we're doing our best to estimate uh, what's going on, and we're not necessarily, you know, uh, we need to try to use an appropriate model, uh, <clears throat> but uh, it's not, uh, uh, it's not a perfect reflection of reality. Uh, yeah, uh, so yeah, we'll do some, we'll do some questions.